this episode of Trial Story. He called me into his office and he put his hands down the front of my skirt. Colleen Shalak accuses her boss of sexual harassment. Adults can and do say no. Adults can and do walk away. She says her boss made life in the office a nightmare. Will the jury believe her? Next on Trial Story, from opening statements to the verdict, crude conduct, a $9 million suit for sexual harassment. Sexual harassment of working women is an issue of national concern. In the fall of 1991, the country watched on television as a Senate committee investigated allegations of sexual harassment made by Anita Hill against then Supreme Court nominee Judge Clarence Thomas. This is not a trial. This is not a courtroom. What you saw then was a Senate hearing. What you will see now is a sexual harassment trial involving this woman Colleen Shalek. I think when it very first happened, um, it was very, I was very embarrassed and I, I wanted to um, take care of it and I thought I would forget about it and I could put it behind me. She is a 26-year-old attorney. She claims her problem was sexual harassment. I sat down and I tried to figure out what my problem was and I, I think it was mostly because of the fact um, he picked me to victimize and I let him get away with it and the only way I could really get over it was to confront him with it. She is referring to this man, Alan Hines. In 1988, Colleen Shalek worked for Hines as a summer law clerk at an influential state agency that trains and assists state prosecutors. It's called the Arizona Prosecuting Attorneys Advisory Council, or APAC as it's known. The APAC workplace appeared to be like any other office. There was a handful of employees and one executive director, Alan Hines. But according to Shalek, the office was anything but typical. Colleen Shalek's attorney, Todd Schleyer. This is probably the most offensive, revolting, and disgusting workplace that anybody could possibly imagine. There were lewd and crude sexual gestures. Mr. Hines would drop his pants in the office. He would simulate um, having intercourse with some of the females. He would grab his crotch. Uh, he used some of the most um, vulgar and descriptive language that uh, you could possibly imagine. Colleen Shalek says her boss used abusive language, made foul gestures, and made sexual advances toward her at the office. And she claims those advances culminated in a sexual assault. But Shalek didn't go to the police. She didn't mention sexual harassment or rape to anyone. She returned to law school in Washington, D.C., not until June of 1990, two years later, did she come forward. She brought her case to the attention of the county prosecutor. But she says because the prosecutor was a friend of Hines, the criminal investigation went nowhere. Hines was never charged with rape. So Colleen Shalek took action anyway. She filed a civil lawsuit of sexual harassment. And she is asking for $9 million in damages. Shalek is suing two defendants, Alan Hines and the agency he ran, APAC, for sexual harassment and emotional trauma. In addition, she is suing APAC for negligence. She says it did not supervise the workplace. Sexual harassment is defined as unwelcome sexual advances and offensive conduct. But the key question in this case is this. Were Alan Hines' actions unwelcome? And if they were, who should be held responsible? On the other hand, did Colleen Shalek invite certain behavior? The defense has a much different portrayal of what happened between Colleen Shalek and Alan Hines. It says Shalek welcomed Hines' sexual advances, suggesting what happened was between a man and a woman who knew exactly what she was doing. Attorney for Alan Hines, Stephen Goodtell. Our contention is she went back to the room willingly and did whatever she contends occurred in that room very willingly that it was consensual, that instead of leaving or, or trying to get away uh, from the source of this alleged trauma, she would continually go back to the APAC offices, continually see Mr. Hines. Although APAC is also a defendant in this case, we're going to focus almost exclusively on Colleen Shalek's allegations against her boss. Was she the victim of sexual harassment? She says yes. Her former boss, Alan Hines, says no. He says he never made any unwelcome sexual advances. 
It's now up to Colleen Shalek to make her case, because as the plaintiff, she has the burden of proof in this case, which means that it is up to her to prove the allegations, not up to the defendant to disprove them. Her attorney, Todd Schleyer, begins with an opening statement. I will prove that Mr. Hines engaged in revolting sexual conduct in the workplace with Ms. Shalek and other female employees, and that sexual harassment outrageous conduct. Prove to you that Ms. Shal Mr. Hines sexually assaulted Ms. Shalek. I will be given an opportunity to discuss what I believe the evidence means. And at that time, I'm certain you will return a verdict for Ms. Shalek, an amount that is adequate to compensate her for the permanent injury she has sustained as a result of these defendants' misconduct. Attorney for the defendant, Alan Hines, Stephen Goodtell. At the end of this trial, you will be asked to decide whether Ms. Shalek had sexual intercourse with Mr. Hines voluntarily or not. You will be asked to decide why she went into that room and what she expected to occur when she went into that room. Ms. Shalek will report that Mr. Hines said three or four times, I want to make love to you. And I apologize. I want to and suggest that they go somewhere to talk. They do. Ms. Shalek voluntarily goes with Mr. Hines to her hotel room. There they have sexual intercourse. On June 1, 1990, she finally tells the police authorities that she was raped by Mr. Hines almost two years previously in Sedona, Arizona. In considering this evidence, Ms. Shalek's evidence, we must look clearly at what is going on here and render a verdict in favor of Alan Hines. How does an attorney prove a woman was sexually harassed by her employer, an act which usually has only two witnesses, the harasser and his victim? Well, one tactic is to show a pattern of previous misconduct. As Todd Schleyer opens his case, that's exactly what he intends to do. First up, Denise Helm, an APAC office worker. During the time that you work for APAC, uh, how would you describe the language that Mr. Hines used in the workplace? It was real crude. You ever grab his crotch in the workplace in your presence? Yes. How frequently did that occur? Quite a bit. Sometimes twice a day? It could, could have. It and then sometimes it didn't happen? Correct. When he engaged in that type of gesture, what would he say? Hold this. Did you believe as a female employee that that gesture and his comment was offensive? Yes. Do you think it was disgusting? Yes. Do you think it was inappropriate for the workplace? Yes. At any time when Mr. Hines grabbed his crotch and said, hold this in front of any of the female employees, did any female employee ever take him up on his invitation? No, not that I know. You ever see Mr. Hines put his hands into his pants and engage in some type of simulation? Yes. Tell the jury what he would do. He would unzip his pants and then he would take his finger and put it through the zipper and then move his finger. In a sort of a sexual manner? Yes. He did this directed towards some of the female employees? Yes. Again, you felt that was disgusting? Yes. On cross-examination, Alan Hines' attorney, Stephen Goodtell, questions Denise Helm about APAC employees' Ms. actions Helm. in the office. His point is this, Heinz's conduct was not unwelcome. Ms. Helm, in the office, isn't it true that the women would discuss their sexual relations with each other? Occasionally. And Ms. Hodgins, she would discuss her sexual, sexual activities too, would she not? Yes. That Ms. Hodgins uh, had a little poster on her computer, did she not? Yes. What did that poster say? Something to do with 
sexual harassment accepted in this area. Did Ms. Hodgins on occasion go into Mr. Hines's office and sit? Yes. Now, Mr. Hines's office, as I recall, there's a desk and then a long table. Looks like a T. Yes. What would, how would Ms. Hodgins sit in Mr. Hodge, in Mr. Hines's office? There was a time that she got up on top of the table and sat cross-legged, like Indian style. Facing Mr. Hines? Yes. What kind of clothes was she wearing? I believe it was either a skirt or a culotte skirt type thing. Plaintiff's attorney Todd Schleyer calls Kathleen Sullivan to the stand, a former APAC law clerk. Can you recall approximately when the first sexual advance was made toward you by Mr. Hines in the APAC elevator? It was between in November and December of 1987. And please tell the jury what happened. I was leaving work early that day. Uh, during the school year, the clerks worked partial days. And I went to the elevator and went down. When the doors opened on the first floor, Mr. Hines was there. He pushed me back into the elevator, shut the doors, pinned me up against the wall, held my hands behind my back, put his hands inside my dress, and after a few minutes, he said, nothing happened here that you didn't want to, right? And I said, yes. And he let me go, opened the doors. I went out of the elevator and back to my car, and he went up to work. What when was the second event? Um, April of 1988, March or April of 1988. And again, this uh, incident occurred in the uh, APAC elevator? Yes, it did. It was almost exactly the same thing. Um, I left work about 3 o'clock, and when the doors opened, he was standing there. This time I had on a skirt and a blouse. He pushed me back in the elevator, pulled my skirt down over my hips, my blouse up over my head, and kissed me, fondled me, put his hands inside my pantyhose, and um, held me there for several minutes. Did he say anything while this was occurring? He made a lot of crude remarks. Um, he said he wanted to f me. He said that um, I turned him on. He really wanted it, baby. Uh, a lot of things like that. So were there other occasions when you reported Mr. Hines' conduct to any person? Yes, I reported it um, at three or four times to David Adams. Why did you report it to Mr. Adams? He was our supervisor. He was the only person I had any access to. After the 1985 incident, when was the next time that you can recall um, discussing Mr. Hines' uh, misconduct with Mr. Adams? After the Christmas party in 1986. Tell me uh, what you told Mr. Adams, please. I pointed out that all of the female employees were afraid to be alone when Mr. Hines was drinking or if he'd been out drinking. Um, we always made it a habit to go places in twos so that there was never anyone alone in the office where he might be. And that we had made a, an agreement to always have two or three of us go to the elevator so we wouldn't go down the elevator by ourselves after work at five. And uh, we just looked out for each other to make sure. And I was telling Mr. Adams about the arrangements we'd made to prevent any sort of assault or encounters. Did any of the female employees use obscene language in the workplace? We all tended to use obscenities. I don't believe they were directed in an obscene fashion. It was the language du jour. We, um, you would hear the word often um, in moments of frustration, down, hell. Obscene I don't believe the female employees directed it at people in an obscene way, no. Um, did Mr. Hines? Objection, Your Honor. Seek state of He was off, he often used obscenity as a way of making a point and uh, intimidating. Defense attorney Stephen Goodell's cross-examination is short and to the point. He questioned Sullivan's credibility. He wants to know just how offensive and unwelcome were Hines's advances. Did you ever suggest to Alan Hines that you wanted to engage in sexual intercourse with him? Yes.
Yes. And Mr. Hines asked you to engage in sexual intercourse with you, is that correct? Yes. And you did voluntarily, is that correct? Yes. On two separate occasions? Yes. Attorney Schleyer wastes no time on redirect examination, asking Sullivan why she had sexual intercourse with Alan Hines. When my husband died and I knew I was leaving APAC, it really did seem inevitable that I would have sex with Al. And in my mind, the best way to get back the power to, to be back in charge was to say yes, was to say, okay, buddy, my terms, I'll say yes, and it will happen. But in my mind, it was because that was the only way I could get back the power he had taken from me, was by turning it around so that I said yes, instead of him intimidating me. And where did the first incident occur? In his office at APAC on the conference table. Attorney Schleyer told us later he wanted to establish two points here. He wanted to convince the jury it was more than probable that Hines could have harassed Shalek. But Attorney Schleyer is doing something else here. He is focusing the jury's attention on the fact that sexual harassment isn't just about sex. It's about the abuse of power in the workplace. In a criminal trial, it's the defendant's choice whether or not to testify. But in a civil lawsuit, it's fair game for a plaintiff's attorney to call a defendant to the witness stand. That is exactly what attorney Todd Schleyer will do. Could you please state your name for the record. Alan R. Hines. Mr. Hines, how old are you? 53. In August 1988, you would have been 50 years old? 49. 49. You were formerly the executive director of APAC? Yes, sir. For what period of time? From May 31, 1977, till February 2, 1991. So during the time that you've been executive director, have you used off-color or vulgar language in the presence of female employees? Occasionally, yes. Please tell the jury what type of uh, words you've used in the presence of female employees on a weekly basis. No, I don't think there were any words that I used on a weekly basis in that I was out of the office sometimes for a couple of weeks before it didn't come in. Tell the jury what kind of uh, words that were off-color or vulgar that you would use in the presence of female employees, sir. I used each and every word that the jury has already heard that I used. Okay. Mr. Hines, you're acquainted with Ms. Shalla, correct? Correct. Uh, when did you first meet her, sir? I believe... My first recollection of meeting her is when she came into the office after she had called to determine whether or not she could work as a law clerk at APAC. You don't recall her being a student of yours when you taught at Arizona State University uh, in a class called criminal justice? She told me that she had been a student of mine. I do not have a specific recollection of Ms. Shalek in the class. Okay. Uh, she contacted you in March 1988 and asked for a summer job to yes. be a law clerk? Yes. And when she came to uh, Phoenix in the spring of 1988, you had an interview with her and you hired her? I believe I asked her to speak to Mr. Adams. And she was ultimately hired? I believe she was, yes. Isn't it true that while you were in the office during the summer of 1988, that whenever you were there, Ms. Shalek would speak with you? I'm not sure of the answer to that. I, if, I, I, I can't say that that was not the case. Ms. Shalek had conversations with you about her career after law school, correct? Yes, sir. You never discouraged her from coming in to talk to you, did you? I have no specific recollection of discouraging her, no. Um, it was uh, obvious to you that she respected your opinion, sir. Is that right? It appeared to be the case, yes. The type of conversation she would have with you were the type of conversations a daughter would have with her father about making career choices. Isn't that right? Well, I don't know that that's true. Well, isn't it true, sir, that um, you agree that Ms. Shalek viewed you as a father figure? No, I don't know that I agree with that, sir. During the time that Ms. Shalek would come in your office, did she discuss with you a Catholic priest who she was a close friend with, a Father O'Day? Yes, sir, as I recall, she did. And she spoke very highly of him, didn't she? Uh, yes, she did. 
And isn't it true that she told you that she viewed her relationship with you similar to the relationship she had with this Catholic priest, Father O'Day? I do not recall specifically the comparison. It is possible, but I don't recall that specifically. You recall that she told you that she cared for you and respected you like she did Father O'Day, or words to that effect? I recall her saying that uh, she thought I was, and I think the term was quality people, but I don't recall the comparison to Father O'Day. It may have occurred. Recall telling Ms. Shalek that you were honored that she had so much trust and confidence in you. Yes, I believe I did. Attorney Schleier wants to question Hines about exactly what happened at the APAC conference in 1988. But that put Hines in a very tough position. You see, he was never charged with rape. But he could still be if new evidence is discovered, evidence such as statements he makes on the witness stand under oath in this civil trial. It is now an issue of defense strategy. Should the defendant answer Attorney Schleier's questions? and possibly open himself up to criminal prosecution? Or should Hines take the Fifth Amendment, his constitutional right not to testify in a way that may incriminate him? Let's turn our attention to the 1988 APEC summer conference, okay? You were at dinner at the Oaxaca restaurant, isn't that correct, on Sunday evening, August 14th, 1988? Your Honor. I respectfully decline to answer that question and to avail myself of the protections afforded me by the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Arizona. Would your response be the same relative to all of the activities surrounding that summer conference? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe they will. Okay. Your Honor, I believe that there are certain questions uh, that uh, I would like to ask Mr. Hines uh, about which he has not invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege. Okay. August 15th, 1988 was the first date of the summer conference, correct? Uh, yes, sir, I believe it was. There was a poolside cocktail party at the Poco Diablo Resort starting at about 6 o'clock. Uh, yes. Ended at about 8 o'clock? Uh, I believe that's fairly accurate, yes. During the cocktail party, did you have anything to drink? Yes. What did you have, sir? I believe one or two vodka martinis. You hadn't eaten dinner yet, correct? No, sir, I hadn't. Um, after you had the one or two vodka martinis, did you uh, then go to dinner with some of the county attorneys? Yes, I did. And at the restaurant, did you have anything further of an alcoholic nature to drink? Yes, I did. Please tell the jury what you had to drink that night. I believe I had another one or two vodka martinis. Uh, some white wine with dinner, and I believe a cognac after dinner. So you, so at least by the end of that dinner, you had somewhere between two and four vodka martinis. I say that's accurate. You know how much uh, white wine you drank that night? No, I don't have any recollection of that. Was it more than a glass? I believe it was more than a glass. And then you had a cognac after dinner. Yes, sir. You didn't drive back from the restaurant to the uh, Poco Diablo Resort, did you? No, sir, I did not. Uh, you believe that uh, you had had enough to drink to have been dissuaded from driving an automobile? Yes. When you returned to the Poco Diablo Resort, did you go into the hospitality suite? Yes, I think I did. did you start drinking beer at that time? No, I don't recall that. Did you continue to have contact with Ms. Shalek after the APAC Summer Conference 1988? Your Honor, I respectfully deny, or I respectfully decline to answer that question. I wish to avail myself of the guarantees provided me by the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Arizona. Will your answer be the same relative to any further uh, questions that are asked of you relative to your conversations and relationship with Ms. Shalek from that time to the present? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. I have no further... I don't believe I have any further questions. Then, Your Honor, if the witness is not going to answer my questions. Okay. Heinz's attorney did not cross-examine, and that can only help the plaintiff. The jury will never hear Alan Heinz tell his version of the story. 
and the judge will instruct the jury it may consider Heinz's refusal to answer questions on the stand. Trying to understand human behavior is a large part of a sexual harassment case. It's what it's all about. And this case is certainly no different. Attorney Schleyer calls Dr. Lynn Hazard, Chalik's psychologist, to the witness stand. Hazard's testimony is critical to the plaintiff's case. Attorney Schleyer must not only prove Shalek was sexually harassed, but also that the harassment caused emotional injury. Dr. Hazard's diagnosis, Shalek suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. I believe that the cause as reported to me of her um, disorder was the sexual assaults that she reports having occurred in August and December of 1988. Some of the symptoms are flashbacks, nightmares, intense depression. And according to Hazard, these were very common reactions for people who experience traumatic events like sexual assault. I believe that she's uh, suffered damages in a, in a variety of areas. Um, let me kind of go through them. First, she feels embarrassed. She feels damaged. She feels like soiled goods. Um, she has a great deal of embarrassment and shame about what happened. And it's still very difficult for her to talk about the sexual abuse. Uh, Long-lasting after effects include things such as when she is um, subjected to anything that resembles or symbolizes the original trauma, it's likely to reopen the emotional pain and the wounds that she experienced initially. She's also likely to experience um, significant sexual dysfunctions. There is still another reason why Dr. Hazard's testimony is so critical in this case. In Arizona, Colleen Shalek was required to file her lawsuit within one year of the alleged assault, and she didn't. Attorney Schleyer must now prove why. His expert's testimony could provide the answer. Rape trauma syndrome. Please tell the jury what rape trauma syndrome is. Um, rape trauma syndrome is a more specific way of describing um, what someone who suffers po from post-traumatic stress disorder um, has experienced. It's just a, uh, a more complete way of uh, understanding um, the, the resulting symptoms. The victim has one or, of two styles. One is the controlled style in which um, they don't outwardly express all the feelings and the turmoil that they're feeling inside. Um, they kind of um, hide it and keep it to themselves so others are not aware of how they're feeling. And then there's alternately the express style in which they do express those feelings. There has been testimony that Ms. Shalek appeared normal um, during the week of the, the uh, APAC conference, uh, engaged in activities. Is that consistent with the controlled style that you've talked about? Yes, it is consistent with the controlled style. She would um, appear, by her own report to me, she tried to appear normal so that others wouldn't realize uh, what she was experiencing because of the shame and humiliation associated with that. She said to me that there was a reason I was 23 and a virgin, and this was not what I was waiting for. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty as to why Ms. Shalek did not file a notice of claim with Mr. Hines or with APAC within one year of August 15, 1988? Uh, Jack, that calls for a legal conclusion, not within the expertise of this witness. Overruled. You may answer. Um, I believe that she was unable to because of the social and emotional consequences of the sexual assault she reports. Anticipating the defense's cross-examination, attorney Schleyer has one final question for Dr. Hazard. Why would Shalek continue to have contact with Hines after he allegedly raped her? He was a father figure to her and a mentor and she trusted him. For a long, long time, he was the only one that knew what occurred. So she went back to him for counseling about what to do about this. And as she said, she was going to a rapist for rape counseling. But for her, it was a way to undo what had happened, to try to right the situation, to try to put him back in the role of a mentor. So that's why she continued to have conversations with him and contact with him. On cross-examination, Alan Hines' attorney, Kent Kamnack, tries to shoot holes through the doctor's testimony. His plan of attack? Question whether Shalek's appearance after the alleged assault match the symptoms of a rape trauma victim. You've uh, testified regarding a number of actions that you believe illustrate uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of those that you emphasized, I recall, was that it is not inconsistent with uh, that disorder to try to act normally. 
That's correct. Um, rape trauma victims will often try to appear normal so that other people's um, suspicions won't be aroused and um, they won't have to bear the shame and humiliation. It would also be consistent for them to act upset, wouldn't it? It could be. And it would uh, be consistent with that disorder to actively pursue conversations and meetings with the other person? Could you clarify, do you mean with the assailant? With uh, the accused assailant, yes. Yes. Uh, and it would also be consistent to avoid that person? Yes, it would. Would it be uh, consistent with the... Uh... May I approach again, Your Honor? Yes. Would it be consistent with rape trauma syndrome for a victim to pose for a photograph with uh, a friend showing her hands on her breasts? Well, what would be normal, whatever would be normal behavior for her, um, so if this would be normal behavior for her prior to the incident, I think she would try to appear as normal. Um, that is, she would try not to change her behavior um, in any way. And so so what she, she, if she were um, joking around and posing um, for um, funny quote-unquote funny pictures, she might continue to do that. So what you see in Exhibit 47, it's your testimony that that would be consistent with a post-traumatic stress disorder re reaction? I think you're misstating what I'm saying. What I'm saying is she would try to appear normal, so any behaviors that she might ordinarily have engaged in, such as posing for a uh, quote-unquote funny picture, she would tend to engage in. Is your testimony that she didn't understand that he wanted to have sex with her that night? She didn't interpret it that way. Did she tell you that um, that Mr. Hines had used some crude language in the office place? Yes, she did. And she told you that uh, when he was crude in his language in the office place, she would go back to her office, right? She'd leave his presence, yes. Or sure, and to get stop. away from the language. Yes. Did she tell you that he put both of his hands inside her skirt? Yes, she told me that. And did she tell you that when she told him to stop, he did? She told me that he, that's exactly right, that he did stop. It is now time for Colleen Shalek to take the witness stand to tell her side of the story. The plaintiff must now prove her case. Was she a victim of sexual harassment? In Judge Robert Meyer's courtroom, the jury must base its decision on what a woman would consider offensive and unwelcome conduct. Now, this is what some courts refer to as the reasonable woman standard. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be done. Plaintiff Colleen Shalek takes the stand. How would you characterize Mr. Hines' language? Um, he would, he used foul language um, on a regular basis and on occasion he made some pretty crude comments. What, uh, directed toward you? Yes, at one point. Uh, what comments did he direct to you, please? One time I was in his office and we were talking about law school um, and I got up to leave and I walked out and he called me back in. Um, and I just, I stuck my head back in the door and I said, I asked him what he wanted. Um, and he nodded to the phone and he just, he said, buzz me when you're moist. What was your reaction? I told him I thought he was disgusting. Did you then leave? Yes. Were you offended by that? Yes. You didn't believe that was an appropriate thing for him to say in the workplace? No, I felt it was very inappropriate. Um, did you ever use a curse word in the workplace? Oh, I'm sure I did. When you used a uh, curse word in the uh, workplace, did you consider that to be an invitation for Mr. Hines, the executive director, to come up and touch you uh, inappropriately? Objection, Your Honor, leading. Overruled, but um, after this question, Mr. Schleyer, please try not to lead the witness. Okay. No. Were there any other um, occasions when Mr. Hines uh, made comments of a sexual nature which you found to be offensive? Yes. When was that, please? Um, again, 
one time I was in his office um, and I noticed that there was a target above his desk and I, I guess I wasn't really, I didn't know what it was for and I asked him and he said that that was his target when he masturbated. Did Mr. Hines have a statue on his desk? Yes, he did. Could you describe that to the jury? Um, it, I think it was like a little man and he had a barrel around him. Um, and one time I was in there and Mr. Hines pulled the barrel down and the statute had um, a, a penis that would like have gone around, fallen down like around his knees. Um, and Mr. Hines made the comment to me that he was proportionately that big as, lo as well. What did you say to him? I told him he was gross. Shalek claims Hines' harassment wasn't limited to vulgar language. He made sexual advances that were specifically unwelcome on two occasions in the APAC office. Um, I was sitting in the back office again with the two other law clerks. Um, and he came up to me and he reached across my desk to get something and he touched my breast. And you were giving him the benefit of the doubt at that point? Exactly. I didn't say anything to him because I assumed he would have just said, he, you know, excuse me. Okay. Was there a second occasion? Yes. When was that? Um, it was a little while after the first incident. Um, it was after lunch because he had come in from lunch and it, he seemed to have um, had been drinking at, at the lunch hour and he called me into his office and he kind of met me at the door and he put his hands down the front of my skirt. Did he get uh, into your pantyhose or underwear? No, he just he put it, his hands like between my skirt and my slip. What was your reaction? I told him to get his hands out of my skirt. What did he do? He backed off and he took his hands away and he started laughing. He said, you know, I wasn't going to hurt you. I just wanted to grope you. What did you say? I told him that it was, you know, he was rude and I didn't appreciate it and I laughed. Colleen Shalik must now tell this jury what happened at the APAC summer conference in 1988. Attorney Todd Schleyer told us later that this was a critical point in the plaintiff's case. You've told the jury that on that Sunday night, Ms. Shalek, that Mr. Han, Mr. Hines put his hand um, into your pants. He told you several times that he wanted to make love to you, and he had been drinking. Um, what were your thoughts at that time that led you to go to the room with him? I thought at that point, um, combined with the information that I had about him having affairs, I thought basically he was propositioning me and he wanted to know if I wanted to have a relationship with him um, and I kept thinking you know he he wasn't thinking clearly he was drunk we needed to sit down in a quiet place I needed to say you know no you've got the wrong impression of me I'm sorry but I have no intention of having a sexual relationship with you did you have any anticipation that any uh, harm would come to you by going to the room no at the time that you went to the room with Mr. Hines, did you have any intention of having consensual sexual intercourse with no. him? No. Uh, did you ultimately go to your room with him? Yes. What happened next? Um, we, on the way there, I was explaining to him um, rather apologetically that, um, you know, that wasn't my intention and, you know, he must have misunderstood. We went into the, I unlocked the, the hotel room um, and uh, there's a set of chairs that were at the foot of the bed and I went to sit down at one of those chairs. And uh, what happened then? He grabbed me by my arms and he just, the bed was a few feet away and he just turned me around and threw me on the bed. What did you say to him? I started telling him no, that this isn't what I wanted at all. He misunderstood me. Um, and he got on top of me and I tried to push him off of me. Were you crying at that point? Yes, I was. Were you able to push him off of you? No. Did Mr. Hines threaten you with any type of violence? No, he didn't. Uh, did he have any type of weapon with him? No. Then what happened? He, um, he, he continued to, um, he was on top of me. He got my, my shorts and my underwear down and I was crying and saying, telling him to stop. And for a short minute, he did. And he acted like he was going to get off of me. Um, and he just said, fine, you stupid. Um, and I thought he was going to stop. 
Then he just, he yanked my shorts back down and he got on top of me. And what happened then? He made some comment about the fact that I was dry and he grabbed me by my thighs and he started licking me. And then what happened? Then he, he raped me. Throughout all of this time, were you telling him to stop? Yes, until he, once he was inside of me, I just kind of blanked out and I stopped. Did you ever scream? No. Do you know why you didn't scream? I, I mean, this is in hindsight. All I can think of was I, I couldn't believe it was going on. I thought he was going to stop. I thought it was just a misunderstanding. And I don't think I was fully realizing what was going on. Ms. Charlotte, did you consent to uh, that particular act with Mr. Hines? No. Was it unwelcome? Yes. Did you tell him repeatedly no? Yes. Did you tell him to stop? Yes. Did you attempt to physically escape? I did. I tried to push him away and I just, I couldn't get him off of me. What happened after the incident? Um, after the incident, he made some comment about him being an animal. Um, and then he said, I kind of panicked and I said, I'm going back to Phoenix. I need to go back home. Um, and he said, well, now if you do that, um, Bert and Tammy, I had gotten to be pretty good friends with them. And he said, it's going to look very funny and they're going to call you in Phoenix and ask you why you left. Um, and what are you going to tell them? And he said, why don't you just stay a day um, and see how you feel? Did he uh, say anything else at that point? Yes. He then told me that if I wanted to come back and work at APAC, he would give me any amount of money I wanted. What did you tell him? I told him, no, I did not want to be his kept law clerk. So after he did this act with you, he offered you a job? Yes. And you told him you weren't interested? Right. Attorney Schleyer expects the defense to question Shalek about her actions after the alleged assault. He makes a preemptive strike. Let Shalek explain, in her own words, why she didn't leave the conference and why she kept in contact with Alan Hines. Did you consider calling the police that evening? No. How come? I didn't... I was completely embarrassed about it, and I, um, and Mr. Hines also picked up on that. Did you stay the rest of the conference? Yes. And what was the reason that you stayed? I just, I decided I wasn't going to tell anybody, and had I left, there would have been questions to answer that I didn't want to answer. How did you attempt to act for the rest of the conference? I tried to act as normally as I, I think I would have had it not happened. Did you uh, attempt to uh, strike that? Did you try to appear as if you were having a good time? Yes. Uh, generally, what kind of things would you talk about when, you, when he would call you or you would call him? I was, um, at the beginning of our conversations, um, at one point I said, no, this is really wrong and, and I don't want to talk to you um, anymore. I think it's best if we just not be in touch. Um, but then I got, he was the only one I, I talked to about it. And I, I did start up the conversations with him again. I, I felt that there was some way I could rationalize it or make it make sense to me. I thought, you know, maybe if he apologized, I'd be okay with it. Um, whenever he called, I usually got upset, and I usually didn't have a whole lot to say. Um, and he would just go over the fact that, um, you know, the part about the virginity, and that's the reason I was so upset, um, and that he was honored to have taken that. Did you see Mr. Hines again in 1988? Yes. When did you see him? Um, it would have been mid to late December when I got back to Phoenix. Colleen Shalek now tells the jury why she agreed to see Alan Hines when she returned to Phoenix the following Christmas. I got back late one night and he called me the next morning and said, you know, do you want to have lunch? And I said no. And he said, if you want to get over this, you and I have to work things out. Um, and he told me he wouldn't touch me. It's not like um, I needed to be afraid what would happen. He just wanted to make sure everything was okay. Shalek decided to meet Hines for lunch 
But things got out of control when they left the restaurant. Um, when we were leaving, he said, you know, there are a few more things I need to talk to you about. You were completely non-responsive. I'm concerned how you're doing. Um, and I got in the car with him, and he drove to a parking lot and parked in the parking lot. He told me to get in the back seat, and I said no. And I started, um, he started coming at me, and I backed up against the passenger side, um, and I was trying to find the door handle. He put his finger inside my underwear, and he put his finger inside my vagina. Before he started the car, he put his finger in his mouth, and he said, Catholic girls taste the sweetest. Those are the words that he said, to the best of your knowledge? Yes. But he indicated that he misunderstood, um, and now he knew where I was coming from, and now he wanted to just be friends, and he wouldn't bother me with that anymore. Did he then take you back to your car? Yes. Did you see him again during the uh, Christmas break of 1988? Yes. After the, you've been sexually assaulted in Sedona, sexually assaulted again in December 1988. Why would you have lunch with Mr. Hines on a third time? Well, first of all, I'm not claiming any of my actions were rational or um, I wasn't really healthy-minded at that time. Um, I, what I was trying to do was to resolve the issues um, because in the period of time I wasn't speaking to him in a sense, I was acknowledging something went wrong, um, and I, I wasn't dealing with that very well. And I was just, I, I guess I, that was my effort to try and ignore what happened. You then went back to school after the Christmas break? Right. Whether Colleen Shalek voluntarily had sex with Alan Hines is not an issue in this case. Consensual sex is not a defense to a claim of sexual harassment. The issue in sexual harassment cases is whether the sexual advances were unwelcome. Now, because the court recognizes that an employee can be intimidated into consenting, the defense, therefore, must focus on whether Heinz's sexual advances were welcome. One tactic, then, for the defense is to question Shalek's actions before the alleged assault and also afterwards. These photographs were taken later at the conference. Defense attorney Gutel questions whether Shalek's actions are consistent with that of a rape victim. On cross-examination, attorney Goodell wastes no time in asking Shalek why a woman who had been sexually assaulted would decide to have lunch with her alleged assailant, not once, but twice. During that Christmas vacation, you saw him a total of three times, the two luncheons, and then once you were in the APAC office for, uh, go to happy hour with the APAC employees. Is that correct? Right. You weren't avoiding Mr. Hines that Christmas, were you? No. You weren't avoiding APAC? No. And you weren't avoiding any places or people that would remind you of this traumatic event, were they? Were you? Well, what I was doing was um, I was... Um, instead, I was trying to ignore the traumatic event. What I was trying to do was place things the way everything had been before the rape. Um, and in order to, I was trying to act like it didn't happen. And before the rape, Mr. Hines would make vulgar comments, is that correct? In my presence, he made a few, yes. And he would make vulgar gestures, is that correct? Right. Now, you continued to keep in touch with Mr. Hines because in March, during intercession, you went back to see him at the APAC office, didn't you? Yeah, that was the first time I attempted to confront him. And you met behind closed doors with him for about a half hour to 45 minutes, correct? Right. You also wrote Mr. Hines a letter in March of 1982. Is that not correct? 1992. No, I'm sorry, 1989. Right. Thank you. And it, is it not true that you tried to keep in touch with Mr. Hines after March of 89, but that Mr. Hines uh, was, not that it, was not keeping in touch with you? There were two phone calls. It was like late May, early June. And then, because Mr. Hines was not initiating phone calls to you, you called him in 1989, the fall of 89, and told Denise Helm that, to tell that SOB to call or he's going to pay. Is that correct? I did that because um, at that point, Denise had accused me 
Um, at one point she had accused me of being a lesbian and then she turned around and accused me of having an affair with Mr. Hines. And I did that for an effect on Denise because the last sentence of that statement was, um, Denise, you don't realize what's going on. I'm not having an affair with him and someday you're going to find out what really happened. But your message to Mr. Hines was tell that SOB to call or he's going to pay. Is that correct? Something to that effect, yes. Attorney Gattel now questioned Shalek about the night of the alleged assault. His strategy? Portray Shalek as a woman who may have made an error in judgment, but nonetheless an adult who is responsible for her own actions. The defense told us later it's a pivotal point in their case. When you went back into the hospitality suite, you also, Mr. Hines came up and spoke to you at that time? He, yes. And he said that he wanted to make love to you that evening, correct? Yes. You said he said he wanted to fuck you, correct? Right. You also said that he said he wanted to sleep with you, is that correct? Yes. And after he had said all those things to you, you still wanted to talk to Mr. Hines alone, is that correct? I wanted to clear things up, yes. He was drunk. Correct? Intoxicated? Yes. And you went to the wall and talked to him there, correct? Right. And he again told you that he wanted to make love to you, correct? Right. And you said that he told you he wanted to f*** you, correct? Yes. And he said that three or four times, correct? Yes. In that explicit language? Yes. And you voluntarily went off to your room with him, correct? Yes. And you went off to your room with him knowing that what he was doing was propositioning you, correct? Yes, and propositioning is far different than rape in my mind. You were at the Poco Diablo Resort in Sedona, correct? Right. You didn't go to the lounge to talk to Mr. Hines, did you? What lounge? By the registration desk. No. You didn't go to the patio to talk to Mr. Hines, did you? No, we went to my room. You didn't walk up the pathway and have a conversation as you walked outside with Mr. Hines, did you? No. You didn't go to the parking lot and talk to Mr. Hines outside, did you? No. You went to your room with him, correct? Yes, my room was before the parking lot. You also never thought, I suppose, of waiting till the next day and talking to him over a cup of coffee, did you? No, because I didn't think you'd rate me either. So what you did that evening was you took a man that had discussed with you extramarital affairs, who had obviously been drinking, who put his hand on your thigh the night before, who put his hand up your shorts, into your underwear, up your groin and touched your genital area just a little earlier that evening. You took this man who three or four times in clear and explicit language told you exactly what he wanted to do with you. They wanted to make love with you and wanted to apologize, in your words, f*** you, and you went to your room with him, correct? Right. And while you were there, in your room, you didn't yell, correct? Right. You did. Your Honor, asked and answered. Uh, hey, Your Honor. While he was in your room, you didn't try to knee him, correct? Knee him? He was on top of me. You didn't try to run. He was on top of me. I couldn't run. And after he left your room that evening, you continued to seek him out for months afterwards, didn't you? Objection asked and answered. Overruled. You may answer. Do you want me to ask it again? Yes. And after he left your room that evening, after you say he raped you, you continued to seek him out for months and months thereafter, didn't you? Seek him out. I kept in touch with him. Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. The plaintiff, Colleen Shalek, has rested her case. Now it is up to the defense to argue that this is not a case of sexual harassment. All along, the defense strategy has been to make its argument through cross examination. But now the defense attorneys for both Hines and APAC call witnesses of their own. Hines's attorney, Kent Kamnak, gives a summary of a deposition taken from one former co-worker, Dennis Lusk, 
who said Colleen Shalek seemed to invite Heinz's attention. On Monday evening, August 15, 1988, at the APAC Summer Conference in Sedona, Mr. Lusk and Mr. Hines were having a private conversation on the staircase outside the hospitality suite. Ms. Shalek approached the staircase and sat down behind Mr. Hines. From Mr. Lusk's perspective, Ms. Shalek was interposing herself in the middle of his conversation with Mr. Hines. Mr. Lusk gave Ms. Shalek some dirty looks to see if she would leave. Ms. Shalek put her hands on Mr. Hines' shoulders. Mr. Hines said to Ms. Shalek, words to the effect, quote, who said you could put your hands on me, unquote. Ms. Shalek said, quote, do you know you love it, unquote. Mr. Hines said, quote, I am a happily married man, unquote. At which time Ms. Shalek took her hands off Mr. Hines' shoulders, reached around in front of him, and rubbed his chest, stomach, and grabbed him in the crotch with her right hand. After Ms. Shalek grabbed Mr. Hines' crotch, Mr. Hines did not say anything, but he and Mr. Lusk got up and walked away. Ms. Shalek remained on the staircase. Mr. Lusk did not see Ms. Shalek again that evening. APAC attorneys called to the stand Laura Record, also a former co-worker. She testifies that both men and women in the APAC office spoke of sex frequently, including Colleen Shalek, who is referred to here as Kelly. While you were employed at APAC, do you ever recall hearing anyone use foul language in the workplace? Yes. What sort of words did you hear? The jury's probably heard many of them. You can go ahead and say well, them again. It's the gamut. Um, um, oh, I'm going blank, but just about every word in the book, I would have to say. Now, you said that just about everyone used this language. Uh, let me ask you, did you ever hear any of the women in the office use those words? Yes. How often? Daily. This was in the office? Yes. Do you recall hearing any of these women that you've named uh, use this sort of language in the presence of men in the workplace? Yes. Based on your observation and your time in the office, do you have any idea, if anyone, uh, who would be responsible for that language as far as it coming into the office place in the first place? No. How would you describe the, uh, the APAC workplace generally as far as the employees are concerned? It was like a family. We um, oftentimes after work would go out for a drink. Um, people talked about their personal problems with each other, um, you know, cared about each other, I, I thought. Um, and uh, seemed to mingle well and, you know, laugh together, joke together. Uh, it was like a family, it really was. Did you like working there? Yes, I did very much. What's the Royal Wave? The Royal Wave started back when one of the um, royal family in uh, England got married. I think it was Fergie and her husband. And Kathleen got a real kick out of the royal family there. And during the coverage of... Um, the wedding, they would show the family doing this. And after a while, it just annoyed me because Kathleen would keep doing the royal wave. And so one day we were out in the secretary's area and Kathleen was doing it again. And I said, well, this is my royal wave. And I turned around and I was wearing a um, kind of a full skirt. And I took the back end of my skirt and flipped it up. And I had nylons on and like a slip. That, and that became the royal wave. Okay. Did anyone in the office, uh, as far as you could tell, appear to get any, find any humor in that? Well, I had several requests to do it several times. And, By whom? Uh, Bertha, Tammy, um, I think Kelly joined in the uh, request to have that done. I'd say primarily those people. Now, defense attorney Stephen Goodell asks Record to recall yet another incident involving Colleen Shalek. What did she tell you she did at the Price Club, if anything? She was primarily talking about an incident where Tammy, they were out in front where they have a hot dog stand, and Tammy was eating a hot dog and imitating oral sex with the hot dog, and 
Kelly came back and was talking about this incident, laughing about it and saying how she was doing this out in public and it was really funny. Were, was she just speaking to you or were there other people uh, that were part of that conversation? I have a feeling there were a couple other people there. I, I can't really recall who because people were kind of in and out. As she related that story, was there anything she said that indicated to you that she thought it was gross or disgusting? No. Was there anything as she related to this, that story that made you believe that she thought it was obscene? No. Did she appear to be offended by what Ms. Hodgins had done? Absolutely not. What did you observe about the way she acted as she related the story? She was laughing as she was relaying this, um, kind of jumping up and about. I, I would have to say the primary, or primary uh, behavior of hers was laughing at that time. Laura Record testifies she saw Colleen Shalek and Alan Hines together the night after the alleged rape. She was sitting there with him. How would you describe her appearance? She was fine. She was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> she was fine, didn't appear to be upset. She was having a conversation with Mr. Hines. Did you see her at any other time that evening? I had seen her, um, on the breezeway on the side of the hospitality suite with a deputy county attorney from this office. And they were singing or screaming, and I went outside to go see what the ruckus was. They were skipping along or singing, having a good time. It wasn't a scream of fear, but uh, when I just kind of stepped out to see who was making the noise and asked her and the attorney to keep it down. The witnesses have testified. The judge has instructed the jury about the law. Now it's time for the attorneys to make their closing arguments. Mr. Schleyer. Colleen Shalek's lawyer, Todd Schleyer, reminds the jury that this case represents the ultimate in betrayal of trust. You recall, at the beginning of my opening statement, I told you that this case involves a betrayal of trust, an abuse of power, and violation of human dignity. I told you that this case involved the most extreme and the most contemptible sexual harassment imaginable, the sexual assault of an employee by her supervisor. And I also told you that the APAC workplace was Mr. Hines' personal sec sexual playground. And I told you that Ms. Shalek worked at APAC for just three months and that what occurred during those three months changed her life forever. And now you've heard Dr. Hazard come in and she's told you that now Ms. Shalek is condemned to sexual purgatory. I've proven to you that Mr. Hines sexually harassed Ms. Shalek. Based upon Mr. Hines taking the Fifth Amendment, there's no evidence to dispute that the assault was unwelcome in August and again in December 88. That conduct is sexual harassment. It's intentional infliction of emotional distress. Based upon all the evidence, you must find that Alan Hines is liable to Ms. Shalek for sexual harassment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, that APAC is liable for sexual harassment, that it's responsible for Mr. Hines' intentional infliction of emotional distress because he was the CEO and APAC was negligent in supervising him. In a little while, we'll all walk out of here. We'll return to our families. We'll be okay. Soon it'll be Christmas and the holiday season. Charlotte will not be okay. She may never be okay. Remember, she can't come back to you, ladies and gentlemen, in another year, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, and say, hey, remember everything Dr. Hazard testified to in that courtroom that could happen? It did happen. You could never get married. You never had a loving husband. You never had a baby. I still have flashbacks. I don't trust people. I still consider suicide. I've been hospitalized. My life is a shambles. 
She has this one opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. And you must fully compensate her for what she's been through in the past and what might occur in the future. She can't come back. Ladies and gentlemen, based upon all of the evidence, a seven-figure verdict against each defendant might begin to adequately compensate Ms. Shalek for the pain, for the suffering, for the embarrassment, for the depression she has sustained as a result of these defendants' misconduct and for that which she will sustain in the future. Alan Hines' attorney, Stephen Gattel, now gets his last chance to convince the jury of his client's story. Colleen Shalek is an adult who must take responsibility for her actions. This morning, Mr. Schleyer told you that APAC was a sexual playground. Last week, he said it was a sexual playground without any monitors. He didn't mention monitors this morning because he knows playgrounds are for children. And children need monitors. Adults don't need monitors. Adults must take responsibility for their own actions and their actions with regard to others and their actions with regard to others. Adults say no. Adults can and do say no. Adults can and do walk away. You heard the evidence about rape trauma syndrome. A psychologist would appear to claim that any reaction is consistent with rape trauma syndrome. If you act upset, it's normal. If you act normal, it's normal. If you act depressed or act happy, it's consistent. If you cry or smile, it's consistent. According to her psychologist, if she sat in her room and cried all night and day and night and day, or went out and partied, both would be consistent with rape trauma syndrome. When this lawsuit started, Mr. Schleyer talked about abuse of power and violation of human dignity. Remember Kathleen Sullivan? She's the lady who told you that she slept with Alan Hines to get power. Dr. Hazard told you that financial reward can give Ms. Shalek power. Let's talk about the power she had, the power she had over Alan Hines. Alan Hines was prominent, he was politically connected, and he was married. <clears throat> After she slept with him, she had incredible power. She had the power to control his political, financial, and social future, and she used it. All she had to do was cry rape. He couldn't deny the sex. He couldn't even testify about it because he knew, and she knew he knew, he could end up being prosecuted with his own denials. Of course he took the Fifth Amendment. This is a man who spent his entire life in the criminal justice system. He's accused of a horrendous crime. Of course he's going to take the Fifth Amendment. Kelly Shalek indeed now has the power. She has the power that she threatened to use when she told Denise Helm, tell that SOB to call or he'll pay. Don't help her carry out that threat. On behalf of Mr. Hines, I ask you to return a verdict in his favor. The question for the jury is this. Did Colleen Shalek prove she was sexually harassed? While the jury deliberates, they will never know this fact, that before Shalek walked into the courtroom, she entered into two separate agreements, one with Hines and one with APAC. Each agreed that neither side can appeal this case, ever. And so, for Colleen Shalek, it's now or never to recover for her injuries. For the defendants, well, if they lose in front of this jury, they lose for good. And they also agreed to something else here, an undisclosed minimum and maximum amount of money that Colleen Shalek could recover. She sued in this case for $9 million. And while we may never know what that closed-door agreement was, we do know that a favorable verdict guarantees her a certain amount. Her lawyer told us she agreed so that she could put this matter behind her. As for the defendants, if they lose, the agreement guarantees they will not have to pay over a certain amount of money. After three hours, the jury of six men and five women reached a verdict. Would you uh, read the verdict for us? We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths, do find for the plaintiff and against defendant Alan Hines for intentional or reckless infliction of emotional distress and or sexual harassment in the workplace 
and find the full damages to be one million four hundred and seventy six thousand five hundred and fifty three dollars and fifty cents we the jury duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths do find for the plaintiff and against defendant APAC for intentional infliction of emotional distress and or sexual harassment in the workplace and find the full damages to be $908,446.50. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths do find for the plaintiff and against the defendant APAC on the negligent hiring, retention, and supervision claim and find the full damages to be $908,446.50. This was a note that was sent out by the jury. We want it to be clear that we have divided the liability in the following manner. Mr. Hines, $1,476,000. $553.50 and APAC $908,446.50. Total liability is $2,385,000. It's true. It's kind of like Kathleen said, you know, you kind of get a little bit of the power back, and I stood up to him. And I let him know that he picked the wrong person this time. All 11 jurors reached their decision unanimously. The foreman told us he found Shalek's story credible. As for her actions after the alleged assault, he said the jurors decided that that didn't hurt her credibility. As for APAC, its liability was covered entirely by its private insurance. And today, the agency has a new executive director a former Arizona Supreme Court Justice. They also have a grievance policy. As for Alan Hines, he is back in court to decide the question of who will pay Hines's damages. The issue is whether the state of Arizona will have to pay for the misconduct of one of its employees. I'm Greg Jarrett for Court TV.